Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jose Francisco, project manager at the IAS USA. I'd like to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Rogero Bedimo, who will be presenting on weight gain, a growing issue in antiviral antiretroviral therapy. Welcome, Dr. Bedimo. Thank you so much, Jose, and welcome you all to this uh, <clears throat> event. And as the title suggests, this is a growing issue. And I would like to get you through what we have learned in the past couple of years and what I think we still have to learn. And here are my disclosures for the past couple of years. And this is an IES USA accredit, uh, a program that accredited by the ACC AME for 1.5 uh, AME uh, uh, Digital Information Award category one credits. And here are other credits that this activity is recognized for, including 1.25 ABIM block and a nursing contact hours, pharmacy credit. And like. So, and uh, we are grateful for the support of uh, these entities for this program at Atmos Forest, Pediatric Medicine, and uh, Silver Supported Cancer. Uh, <clears throat> this on demand uh, recording and slides from this webinar will be available within 24 hours after the live broadcast at this site, and, and you will receive notice of that. And here is a little bit of a housekeeping, navigating this activity, you will see four questions and there will be a separate window uh, that will show the four question and choose the response from the poll and responses will be displayed after the poll closes. How do you submit the uh, questions? Uh, look at the Q and A button. I will apologize in advance that we are not able to address this, uh, all the questions with time um, allotted. Some people have already submitted uh, questions before the activity. Uh, we take note of those and uh, we will go through them during the activity. And if, uh, if they are left unanswered, we will do so at the end of the activity. And there's also a chat for discussion. <laughs> and again, uh, this is weight gain, a growing issue in antiretroviral therapy. Let's first look at the uh, objectives for today. At the end of this webinar, the participants will be able to, one, assess the magnitude of weight gain associated with antiretroviral therapy. Two, identify predictors of weight gain on antiretroviral therapy. And three, list potential mechanisms and metabolic complications associated with the weight gain during antiretroviral therapy. Now to uh, begin, let's look at the pre-test question, number one. MJ is a 30-year-old Hispanic woman who was diagnosed with HIV disease in 2017 on routine screening. She had no history of opposite infection of now. Her baseline CD4 count was 159 cells per microliter. Her viral load is 857,000. She was hepatitis B immune, hepatitis C antibodies were negative. She weighed 160 pounds, giving her BMI of 27. She initiated antiretroviral therapy with Bifedravir, FTC, and CAP. Over the following two years, she reported a 20 pound weight gain. BMI is now 30. She denies any change in her normal routine of diet or exercise level. Which of the following is correct regarding the weight gain observed in this patient? One, Weight gain on antiretroviral therapy is more likely to occur in men than in women. Two, weight gain is more likely to occur with NNRTI than with INSTI-based regimen. Three, weight gain is more likely to occur with CAF than with TDF-based regimen. Four, exposure to FCC staff will not have <clears throat> been associated with weight gain and if this patient was uh, taking PrEP rather than antiretroviral therapy. So this weight gain is only for people on antiretroviral therapy but not on PrEP. And five all of the goals, please ask. Now let's move on to the pre-test question number two. AB is a 32-year-old Black woman who has been virologically suppressed on EFB, TDF, FTC since 2012. 
He developed progressive worsening insomnia and was diagnosed with depressive disorder. The antiretroviral therapy was then switched to dolutegravir via Batavir TTC two years ago. She has since then gained 25 pounds. She's not concerned about her appearance, but you would like to counsel her about potential metabolic complications of weight gain on antiretroviral therapy. Which of the following is true? Number one, dolutegravir is associated with significant worsening in lipid profiles, which correlates with the weight gain. Two, there is no risk of metabolic complications since most of the weight gain is lean mass, not fat mass. Three, weight gain on antiretroviral therapy is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Four, weight gain on antiretroviral therapy is associated with an increased risk of metabolic syndrome. Please vote. Okay, now let's look at the outline of today's presentation. First, we would like to know how much weight gain are we talking about? What's the magnitude of the problem? And then look at who is affected. So what are the determinants of weight gain? And then how and why the weight gain occurs? Are there patterns of the weight gain and what are the preferred mechanisms? Then we move on to what that does mean clinically and uh, pathophysiologically and metabolically? Are there metabolic complications of this weight gain? And then uh, uh, can anything be done? Uh, we observe weight gain on antiretroviral therapy, but can that be mitigated? Uh, can that be reversed? And then what are gaps in our knowledge and what future directions we would like to take? <clears throat> so weight gain on antiretroviral therapy among people living with HIV. While we're talking about weight gain associated with antiretroviral therapy here, it is important to place it in the general context, contextual framework of uh, pathogenesis of non-infectious complications uh, of HIV, because there are three sets of factors that are potentially acting in concert. Factor one is the patient, potentially predisposed to the condition that we're looking at, in this case, weight gain, <clears throat> uh, rather through genetic or behavioral factors. Factor two is the virus. So the virus is likely through persistent inflammation and immune activation driving something in the person that is independent of the other factors. And then factor three, which we're focusing on more, the treatment is that the drug therapy giving toxicity, uh, but that toxicity is it worse in certain groups of people and with some viruses. So let's move on now in uh, question one, in the first part of this presentation, weight gain on antiretroviral therapy initiation. And this is a 27-year-old African-American woman recently diagnosed with HIV. CD4 count is 198 and viral load is 649,000. She's hepatitis B immune and hepatitis C antibody negative. She's eager to start antiretroviral therapy, but has heard of the potential of weight gain. You tell her that the greatest potential for weight gain is associated with one, men and white race. Two, integrase trans transfer inhibitor based regimens. Three, protease inhibitor based regimens. Four, non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor based regimens. And five, the jury is still out. We don't know. Please vote. Uh, let's look at the results. All right, so for 59% of you, the answer is correct, integrase trans transfer inhibitor-based regimen. And we will explore that further. And this is the correct answer. Now, let's first look at, this is one of the initial cohorts, the so-called NA accord, to document weight gain on antiretroviral therapy. Three observations can be made from these graphs. Number one, the magnitude of weight gain appeared to be greater with exposure to integrase inhibitors, INSTI, the curve in red, than with protease inhibitors or non nucleoside resistance inhibitors. Fact number two, among the integrase inhibitors, <clears throat> dolutegravir appears to be associated with greater weight gain than the older integrase inhibitors, elvategravir and elvategravir. So 
Fact number three is that the weight gain that you're observing here, let's go back to the graph on the left, is front loaded. So greater weight gain in the first year of ART. And we have here the BMI increase uh, estimated in the first two years of ART by these three uh, regimens was about 0.4 for instance, 0.3 for PIs and 0.2 for NLRTI. So the weight gain on other therapy appears to be front loaded, either slows down or plateau thereafter. And this is another uh, analysis that we did uh, in the single center study of about 4,000 racially and ethnically diverse population of people living with HIV. Here we show that significant disparities exist in the magnitude of weight gain on antiretroviral therapy. First, by sex on the left, with women gaining more weight on instincts and PIs than men. And two, by race and ethnicity on the right, uh, with greater magnitude of weight gain on instincts being observed among Blacks in blue and Hispanics in red. So those are two determinants that is important to uh, uh, pay attention to from now on. And this, now we move on to a full analysis of eight phase three randomized control trials of first line antiretroviral therapy initiation during 2003, 2015, about 5,600 patients. The baseline factors that were associated with weight gain in this analysis uh, included lower CD4 cell count, higher HIV viral load, no injection drug use, female sex, black race, symptomatic HIV, and younger age, as well as higher BMI. Now you see now beginning to emerge a pattern of predictors. We talked about black race, and we talked about female sex. And now we have all the uh, 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 predictors here that are lower CD4 count and higher viral load. So, the most advanced patients gain the most weight <clears throat> in this particular um, analysis. Now, we also hear uh, newer uh, uh, to the slide that I presented earlier, observing differences in weight gain by NRTI groups with the curve on the right showing you that TAF is associated with uh, greater magnitude of weight gain in red, than abacate in blue and uh, TDF uh, in yellow. And that uh, AZT was actually saying with either a plateauing or a slowing down of the weight uh, change during antiretroviral therapy, the fact that we will return to. And other observations from this analysis are consistent with the observational studies that I presented earlier, which included findings of greater weight gain among female and in blacks. Now, I'm looking here at the advanced study, which is very aptly named because it actually did uh, advance our knowledge uh, uh, greatly on uh, about uh, antiretroviral th uh, therapy associated with gain. Uh, first thing that you will notice here is that you see greater increases. And by the way, the advanced uh, therapy randomize people to receive two dolutegravir-based antiretroviral regimens, one with TDF-FTC in blue and another one with TAF-FTC in red, compared to the standard of care in South Africa, which was a TDF-FTC effagorates. And the first fact we see here is a greater increase uh, in weight <clears throat> in the two dolutegravir arms, uh, which you see greater even uh, uh, with the uh, TAF-FTC dolutegravir than tdf dolutegravir. <clears throat> and also there is um, um, a higher um, uh, a weight increase in women than in men, significantly higher. Here, this analysis is at uh, week 96, showing a 10 kilogram increase uh, with dolutegravir FTC type in women compared to five kilograms uh, in men. Another point here is that there appears to be somewhat of a slowing down or a plateauing of weight increase in men that was not observed in women. Final fact in this slide is that you have a group of people who achieved more than 10% weight increase on 
and ATI, and this will uh, 25% of the group of dolgegal deficit versus 13% dolgegal deficit and 11% to have a deficit. So these are the extreme weight gainers were more represented in the dolgegal deficit. Similarly, treatment in emergent obesity was observed in 19% in that first group, and uh, which is statistically significant different from the other groups. So the estimated BMI increase here at one year was 1.5 in male and two in females. If you remember, when I presented the data from the, in the US in the NA Accord, the average BMI increase in the take life year was 0.5. So this is an even greater weight increase than we have observed in the US studies, possibly because this uh, study is almost entirely among Blacks. And we've already showed you that uh, Blacks were more likely to gain weight in US studies. So patterns are beginning to emerge in what are the determinants and predictors of weight gain, but not entirely. And following up on the advanced study after uh, 144 weeks, we continue to see increases in weight. So far from the plateauing that we appear to have been observing at week 96 among men, there was a further gains in weight in that group. And while in women also, we continue to see even greater amounts of weight gain. So one thing that we have looked at uh, uh, up to now is uh, increases in weight gain with uh, instis and with DAF and with less amount of weight gain uh, with NNRTIs. So that is important uh, because thus far, we've seen this lowest magnitude of weight gain in NNRTI. And as we, let's look at what is the newest drug in that class, which is Doradrine. We did not have a lot of data on that until relatively recently. And this analysis is uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a postdoc analysis of the full data from uh, phases two and three um, uh, trials on treatment naive people where Duraglin was compared to an older NNRTI, a five range, uh, and a boosted PI, uh, uh, boosted Daruna. <laughs> and uh, we note that you know, NRTI used in this uh, study are uh, either TDF or a backup. So <clears throat> we see here that there was not sig no significant uh, increases in weight with this Duraglin uh, uh, received compared to the two comparators, uh, a five range, and boosted their own Conversely, ISTIS uh, have been the class that is most associated with weight gain, as we have seen, especially the newer ones, uh, Dolutegravir and Bictegravir, which are analysis from NAR4 and SACS AR that are presented earlier. So what about the newer drug in that class, uh, so-called uh, Carbotegravir, which as uh, one of the paradigm shifts in antiviral therapy, has been done to be used as an injectable long-acting preparation in conjunction with one of the newer and non nucleoside reversion seeking inhibitors, Saril <clears throat> fever. And uh, this was a, uh, there was a slightly a greater uh, median uh, weight gain with the carbotegravy plus refevering. Uh, however, the proportion of participants who gained 10% of weight or more was similar between the carbotegravy plus refevering and long-acting regimen and uh, the comparator uh, oral regimen. So while we saw a, a trend towards greater weight gain with the newer uh, uh, integrase inhibitor uh, um, class here, a, a drug here, we did not see a significantly different proportion of people who gain 10% or more. So let's uh, summarize to this point the magnitude and determinants of weight gain in antiviral therapy initiation in previously naive patients. So we know that instances are associated with significant weight gain and the greater magnitude of weight was observed in people of African descent and in women. We uh, presented the uh, advanced study uh, to back that up uh, with a median uh, BMI change of uh, 1.52 versus 0.5 in the US. Uh, probably greater weight gain in the newer integrases inhibitors, uh, the Lutegravir and Bictegravir, compared to Valtegravir and even Elvategravir for the system. For NRTIs, we've seen greater weight gain with TAF, 
versus a backup gear and TDA. And the greater weight gain if instances are used in conjunction with that, thanks to the advanced study. Uh, this is where we got that uh, uh, detail. And an RTI were less conducive to weight gain. And we will see probably uh, even uh, retarded weight gain. So the balance of uh, the benefits of the ENSTs and TAP, which uh, are used in, in initial antenatal therapy with most people now, has to be uh, a balance with the potential for weight gain. So it's really important as we begin to be more and more concerned about this potential for weight gain that we do not uh, ignore the potential benefits of the uh, faster decline in varimia and a more robust aerobic uh, suppression. So that's just a cautionary tale as we move on. So the hypothesis that would emerge from this is that before, with the older antiretroviral regimens, we did have some people developing lipodystrophy, which was uh, associated with the central obesity and peripheral fat loss. And this change was associated with increased cardiometabolic risk. Now we have the newer, so-called modern antiretroviral therapy, which control varimia a lot better, decrease inflammation, and decrease the uh, reduce the catabolic effects of HIV a lot better. Now, possibly, the better the, and the faster the varimia is con uh, controlled, e.g. with the instance, the more we achieve the so-called return for health, a uh, 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 regaining of weight, and the greater gain of, associated with people who already had a, a significant catabolic uh, status at baseline, uh, evidenced by higher viral loads and lower CD4 count. That is a great hypothesis. So calorie intake also would increase in those who are in care on ART, which uh, probably is greater than what they had before. And that may possibly contribute to the weight again that they incur while in care. So that is what we're going for now as a hypothesis. And that hypothesis appears to be corroborated by this analysis from the Kaiser Permanente, where they did a comparison of BMI over time in people living with HIV versus uninfected control from the database. And <clears throat> they're looking at people uh, 21 years or, or over between 2006 and 2016. And what you look at here is in the linear mixed effect modeling, uh, comparing BMI change over time is that those People living with HIV started with a BMI that was lower by three points uh, than those of uninfected, but they caught up uh, quite quickly in that, well, not very quickly, but comparatively quicker than those with, uh, uh, without HIV infection in the case of permanent database. So the slope of gain weight over the next 12 years was much steeper in people living with HIV now approaching uh, the BMI of those who were uninfected and matched to them by 12 years on antiretroviral therapy. Now, that again is, appears to corroborate the hypothesis that this return to health is probably what is operating here. Now, let's see now what would happen, therefore, if you um, was to take um, uh, people who already were virologically suppressed on ART and switched the antiretroviral therapy. So they had already, quote unquote, returned to health. So let's move on to case number two. MS is a 35 year old white man on a 5 CTCTDA for the past 10 years. He has been very reluctant to change a regimen that, quote unquote, saved his life. However, he's not willing to consider that due to persistent insomnia and depressive disorder. CD4 count is 700. Viral is undetectable, fewer than 20 copies per ml. He is HCV negative, HPV immune. A switch to TDA plus FTC cap will likely result in which of the following? One, no change in weight because the patient was already uh, virally suppressed, so return to health had already occurred. Two, weight loss since staff is associated with fewer metabolic complications. Three, weight gain because of the switch from TDF to TAP. Four, weight gain because of switch 
from Pythagoras to be integral here. And five, both three and four, i.e. the weight gain will be associated with both the switch from TDF to cap and the switch from the five range to be integral here. Please vote. All right, excellent. So I guess for 83% of you, you can sign off. Uh, you've got everything. Uh, you don't need to listen any further. Okay. So it's true, the way change here could be attributed to either the switch to from TDF to CAF or the switch from F average to be integral. Okay, let's move. And these are two retrospective analysis of weight change in treatment experience patients who switch adaptive viral regimens. So let's move on the left first in the ACTG A5001 and A5322 at trial. Weight gain was greater uh, with switch to instincts as depicted here at the bottom. <clears throat> While switch to INSTI led to significant weight gain here uh, statistically significantly, uh, the switch to uh, uh, switch to the, the litography was associated with a significant weight gain. Switch to elvategravir and all the ST or to ratography and all the ST were not associated with significant weight gain. So, and there was uh, <clears throat> even greater weight gain uh, with switch to INST um, uh, associated with a backup. So, those are very small numbers that you cannot really uh, uh, hang your hat on. So on the left, we have ACCG studies showing that uh, switch to uh, uh, instis led to weight gain, <clears throat> and that was primarily represented by switch to the retail. On the right, we have a retrospective single uh, site study uh, that uh, had patients on a five-way CDFTC switching to an insti based regimen versus continuing that regimen. And you see at the bottom here that there was a uh, uh, greater weight gain in those who switch to the integral their back of their And uh, these are the, uh, 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 and that was uh, uh, even greater than those switching to the integral So very consistent message here, even in those who are already variably suppressed, when they switch to INST, especially the integral view, they gained more weight. Now, uh, this is uh, another analysis of the NA accord this time looking at weight change with switch to INSTI, either from NNRTIs in blue or from PIs in uh, red. There was significant weight gain with switch from NNRTIs, as you can see here, uh, statistically significant in uh, a light blue on top. Uh, <clears throat> and women, non white older people with HIV uh, with viral suppression had greater analyzed weight gain after switching from NNRTI to ST base. And there was also consistent with uh, the data that we looked at in treatment naive patients, greater weight gain with the Lutegra here than with the other instance. <clears throat> now, there's a bit of a discordant note from what you've seen thus far, was that there was a slowing of weight gain with switch from the PI to inst. And I will not, uh, have the time to present that data to you, but this is discordant from uh, other data um, like uh, NEET 022 in Europe that had showed <coughs> uh, weight gain with switch from uh, PIs to, uh, to INST. So it's just important to you that not all data have been completely concordant, but uh, the, 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 the greater uh, uh, lines of evidence uh, for greater weight gain with INST especially when you're switching from an NNRTI. And this is actually one of the initial analysis uh, of uh, weight uh, gain with uh, antiretroviral therapy switch, which was a German study uh, depicted on the right here, where people on TDF either switched to CAP and gained about three uh, kilos in the subsequent 260 days, or stayed on TDF and uh, did not gain a um, uh, uh, much weight. And I can also uh, point you to the steel study when you can reanalyze uh, a switch from uh, <clears throat> uh, a TDFFTC to a backup FTC, so staying on TDFFTC. There was 
a, a modest or significant one kilogram weight gain. We will go back to the other data that included uh, 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 affected. So we have now weight gain that was observed even when we switch to uh, 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 ST and even uh, uh, when people were really bad with this surface. Whatever, what, whatever, uh, or even when we switch to TAP. Now, again, uh, weight gain after switching from TDA to TAP, we've already had a hint that the weight gain on previous antiretroviral naive patients was quote unquote front loaded. And these two analyses again show that the same thing applies when you switch to ST or you switch to TAP. On the left first, the opera cohort that shows you that switching to TAP was associated with an early pronounced weight gain uh, for all, and that that weight gain tended to slow down or plateau after about nine months. On the right, the hops uh, cohort also showed that the greatest weight gain occurred in the first eight months post switch, and that was most likely associated with the uh, ST switch. And after eight months, if there was continued weight gain, it was mostly associated uh, uh, with uh, a switch to TAF. So very concordant uh, pieces of evidence now that both in antiretroviral naive and in antiretroviral experience, uh, initiating in the first case or switching in the second case to instis or TAF lead to weight gain that is front-loaded. So occur mostly in the first nine months to a year. And again, this is a similar finding uh, here. Uh, from a more recent analysis of the Swiss cohort. On the left, you have an analysis of uh, 4,375 adults uh, living with HIV uh, who received TDF containing antiretroviral therapy for six months or longer. And when they switched to TAF in blue here, you have weight gain. When they stayed on TDF, there was no weight gain. Another analysis of the Swiss cohort, those who continue the backup year have less weight increase than those who switched to TAF. So very consistent. Now let's go back to uh, 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 um, our conceptual uh, and, uh, framework. Now, a word of caution before we proceed is that the, be, just because instincts and staff are both associated with weight gain, it doesn't necessarily mean that they achieve this uh, through similar mechanisms. So we already are uh, seeing that we have weight gain in both antiviral naive and antiviral experience. This suggests different or maybe additional mechanisms of action than just the reversal of catabolism and inflammatory changes in the post tissue or so called return to health. There may well be a modulation uh, of, uh, of the adipose tissue that is occurring. And I will show you soon some data that's beginning to tell us that there is indeed an induction of adipocyte dysfunction that may be associated with that uh, weight uh, change. And then let's now return to our conceptual framework. Now, we've seen that there are patient factors to the weight gain in antiretroviral therapy. Um, there is, uh, that is number one, there is a reversal of catabolic uh, inflammatory and immune activation uh, effect of the virus. This is factor number two that may be contributing uh, in uh, previously naive patients, or maybe there are other factors or other viral factors that are still operating even in those who are already virologically suppressed, we don't know. And uh, these uh, also have to be taken into account whenever we examine the potential effect of antiretroviral therapy. So it's important to always return to this conceptual framework because it uh, enlightens our understanding of uh, what's happening and why. So number one, the patient. Now, we're living in an obesogenic epidemic, and it's, uh, uh, it's uh, worse in the US than in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, uh, worldwide obesity has nearly tripled uh, in the past uh, uh, 30 years or so. In 2016, more than 1.9 billion adults, 18 years old, were overweight, and of these, 650 million were obese. Uh, so 39% of adults 18 or over were overweight in 2016 and 13% were obese. In the US, rather than having 39% who are overweight like in the rest of the world, 39% or 40% are obese in the US. And that is very important. And also important is to note what are the demographics that are most affected. Blacks, Hispanics, 
and women. So those are exactly the demographics that we've been dealing with here in terms of weight on uh, antiretroviral uh, therapy. So this appears to be a convergence of two epidemics and highlights the fact that the patient factors have to be taken into consideration when you are examining potential effects of antiretrovirus. And this obesity epidemic is only getting worse and appears to overlap significantly with the HIV epidemic, at least in the United States, uh, with overrepresentation uh, in the South, in Blacks, Hispanics, and people of low income. So very uh, concerning. Now, what does obesity do to the body? And uh, obesity induces inflammatory changes uh, in the adipose tissue. And this is a sort of phenotypic modulation of the uh, adipose tissue with progressively greater degrees of metabolic dysfunction and increased inflammation. <clears throat> and here you see that in this modulation, you have an increase in markers of inflammation, um, uh, progressively so as uh, you get uh, a more and more um, um, uh, obesity. And also you have a decline in anti-inflammatory adipokines, uh, mostly uh, here adiponectin, while we have an increase in pro-inflammatory adipokines like leptin. So we are having an, an increase, and here is an, uh, a fat tissue. First here, obesity is an expansion of the volume of, uh, of uh, adipocytes. And as this adipocytes expand, you see here in the stromovascular fractions, so the instances between adipocytes, there is the accumulation of inflammatory cells. And that accumulation is important to note for a number of reasons. If you look at the macro level here, you will see that the way circumference is really correlated with C-reactive protein and macro of inflammation. So those are two pieces of evidence that are showing you that obesity is a sort of significant inflammation and that may occur um, uh, over time. <clears throat> so we need to understand the mechanism of metabolic implication weight gain in HIV. So how about common living with HIV? Adipose tissue represents a potentially important non-lymphoid location for HIV replication. That is important. <clears throat> um, and as a persistent of HIV because of the stromovascular fragment here in between the adipocytes that uh, contains uh, activated innate and adaptive immune cells. And, and those, as you can see here, as you progress from a lean person to an obese person with metabolic dysfunction, is that those immune cells in the adipose tissue are increasing over time, and uh, so is chronic inflammation. So we need to uh, uh, say maybe this is exactly what HIV is exploiting to, to increase um, uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, not only the weight, but also the uh, metabolic complication in people living in HIV. So that's the person. Now the virus, uh, uh, this leads us to the second factor, the virus. The hypothesis of these investigators uh, uh, here uh, was that SIV in monkeys or HIV in uh, humans and uh, viral proteins could induce adipose tissue senescence uh, and thus leading to adipocyte dysfunction that they had hypothesized. And that is indeed what they found. So number one here, you see that in vivo, there are features of adipose tissue aging in SIV-infected macaques with increased P16 and PP53. Number two, in, uh, in, in humans, there, there are features of premature aging of adipose stem cells, uh, again, by increase of uh, P16 and P53, as well as decreased proliferation. And that was deemed to be through oxidative stress that increase in this. And so finally, there was a hint of induction of uh, insulin resistance with these adipose cells that <clears throat> were infected with HIV. And again, this is the virus has not yet factored in the antiretroviral uh, uh, receipt. So is it the patient? Is it the virus? Is it the treatment? Now let's look now at the prospective cohort um, of the 319 uh, HIV mono-infected patients on heart, uh, uh, 64 or 25% and 34, 13%. Gain more than 5% and more than 10% of the weight respectively. The predictors of weight gain included 
uh, a number of things, but not exposure to instis and, and TAP. So here you see that insti and TAP were not predictive. However, TDF in this multivariate analysis predicted weight loss. So the caveat to this, there's an important caveat to this data. The mean exposure to insti and TAP in this study were 31 and 33 months respectively. That's why it's really important to look at the fine print. We already examined in a number of studies before now that the weight gain on insti and TAP is front loaded. After that, it either slows down or plateaus. So we catch in people in this cohort at the time when we don't think uh, in most cohorts they will still be gaining weight. However, it's important to note that exposure to DDF actually predicted weight loss, a fact that we will uh, uh, return to. <clears throat> so, and then weight gain of more than 5% uh, was associated with uh, type 2 diabetes as well as elevated liver enzymes. So these are uh, important facts to consider in terms of metabolic complications of weight gain. Now, let's not completely take HIV out of the equation and just have antiretrovirus. Now, where can you have antiretrovirus without HIV in PrEP studies? And these are two observations. On the left, we have uh, that compared to placebo in the IPREX study, FTC-TDF exposure was associated with delayed um, weight gain. The curve in blue, the weight gain in that group on TDF-FTC was slower than that in placebo. So that's the first inkling that we may actually have uh, not just lack of increased weight, but actually decreased weight in people who receive some antiretrovirus in this instance TDA. On the right, we have another PrEP study that compared to EFFTC to Tavotegra here, uh, showing that <clears throat> uh, there was a greater uh, median weight increase uh, from baseline uh, with Tavotegra field PrEP than with FTC TDA. So finally, we have the START study where ART naive patients we, who, ha, who still had a robust immune function, uh, evidenced by a CD4 count of over 500, uh, were randomized to either immediately starting antiretroviral therapy, that's the immediate start, uh, uh, or delayed antiretroviral therapy until the CD4 count had dropped to 350 or below. And the percent weight uh, again was greater in the deferred arm. So those who waited for antiretroviral therapy gain a little more weight, 1.9% of weight versus 1%. More importantly, the most patients in this study were receiving NNRTI, 80%, and very, very few were on list. And the median CD4 count was also high, and the median viral load was low. So, and if you look at them uh, based on viral load, those who had um, a very high um, um, uh, <clears throat> based on viral load gained as much weight as the other ones. For those who had low baseline viral load, actually uh, gained uh, more weight when they deferred and gain less weight when they initiate. So here's a analytical thought. Antiretroviral therapy with NNRTI, um, uh, uh, as well as with uh, TDF, may probably prevent you from gaining weight that would have occurred if you hadn't taken it. And this is what we've seen in IPREX. We've seen it start, um, um, and, and that's important consideration to start having. And on the same vein, let's look at the pregnancy data. This is an impact to 10 ART uh, naive uh, pregnant women were uh, randomized to receive Doritegra here with either TAP or TDF or the standard of care, Efavirenz FTC TDF. In this analysis, we examine average uh, weekly maternal weight gain which on average was greater in the dolitegravir apps, 0 0.378 uh, and 0.319, versus the favorance arm, uh, 0.291. So that's the, that's the first fact. However, this 0.378 is still lower than the recommended maternal weekly weight gain in the second and third trimester, according to the Institute of Medicine, which is 0.45. So it's not that the retrogravir led to greater weight gain in these pregnant and HIV infected women, uh, but that the fibrinus probably led to less weight gain than was probably good for them. So that's important. And also the postpartum uh, um, mean weight was 4.5 uh, kilograms with the retrogravir, uh, greater with the retrogravir as a fibrinus in the dolphin 2 study. 
and five kilograms greater in the other uh, Latino study. However, the retrogravure mean weight gain was similar to that of women without HIV. So in these analysis, again, it appears that in pregnant women, either uh, during pregnancy in the postpartum uh, phase, it looks like exposure to fibrins led to less weight gain than you would have seen in, in a non-infected woman. So again, so far concluding <clears throat> on the potential mechanisms of weight gain, is that dolitegravir and retegravir increase extracellular matrix production in this adipose tensor and adipocyte. They induce adipocyte dysfunction that may lead to insulin resistance. That's what these studies by Gold are, have shown us. And again, I told you I did not present the new O2 study, but that one showed that switch from PI to INST was associated with a decreased LDL, decreased triglyceride, decreased CRP and cerebrosine 14 which are all good things because this is decreased inflammation. However, it was also shown with decreased adiponectin. I told you that adiponectin is an anti-inflammatory adipokine that is decreased usually associated with weight gain. So the percentage of this adiponectin correlated inversely with the percent change in BMI, which is important. So that begins to tell you that maybe we have something we can measure um, in people that amplified therapy you see instantly and to see if that would predict uh, the weight gain in that region. So we have weight gain in naive, in experience, we have purported mechanisms. Now, what is the cardiometabolic risk? This is WG, a 30 year old white woman who has been on DTG plus staph FTC for the past two years. Myelic is suppressed, a CD4 can is 40. CCRT initiation, she has gained 30 pounds. Her fasting blood glucose has increased from 99 to 135. She reports no change in diet or exercise. Studies have so far shown which of the following cardiovascular or metabolic risk with uh, her weight gain. One, there is no risk for metabolic complications since most weight gain is lean or fat. Two, there's a decreased risk of insulin resistance. Three, there's increased risk of metabolic syndrome and for there's increases of cardiovascular disease. Please go. All right. Let's see the results. Perfect. So two thirds of you um, have seen uh, the increases of uh, metabolic syndrome. While we somewhat think the jury, I mean, we don't have all the data yet, but what we have thus far has not shown increased risk of cardiovascular disease with the weight being associated with antiretroviral therapy. Now, let's uh, move on to see. Okay, and so this is the correct answer, increases metabolic syndrome. Now, what happens to you when you gain weight? In the general population, raised BMI is a major risk factor for a lot of uh, conditions, and those include atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, diabetes, arthritis, uh, muscular skeletal disorders, even some cancers. And, and, and these are also, incidentally, the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in biological so people living with HIV today. So we, again, risk being at the confluence of uh, two bad things. You know, if you gain weight, you more likely to develop uh, these conditions. Uh, people living with HIV are more likely to develop these conditions. Uh, people living with HIV gain weight. So, uh, that may be a, a lot of uh, a bad uh, associations. Worse yet is that diabetes risk associated with weight gain is greater in people living with HIV than in those who are not living with HIV. If you live with HIV on ART, every five pounds of weight gain is actually a 15% increase in diabetes, while the risk is only 8% in the control. This is an older study before we even started getting very concerned about weight gain and therapy, but very telling um, uh, in this case. Now, looking at the, the uh, excess in women, advance again showed us here that most of the weight gain in the dolitegravure arms was fat gain. Uh, that fat gain was brought in the tongue and arms. And then again, those who were on on TAF, uh, in addition to the retrograde, you gain even more fat. 
There was also increases in lean mass. Uh, that was also high in the trigger report. Again, most weight gain was uh, fat gain. So, um, and, and again, here uh, we see that uh, the, in the fat gain arms, there was uh, very uh, much smaller increases uh, uh, in lean and strong fat. And uh, here is the nuance that that question I asked earlier alluded to. We see uh, a little increase, although this increases in BMI across all levels. And here's the DAD analysis, looking at people in the DAD cohort who either <clears throat> started with a low BMI or rather high BMI. And, and either gain a lot of weight or lost a lot of weight. So there's a lot of layers to this analysis. So at, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, increases in BMI across all levels of baseline BMIs were not, were not associated with um, uh, uh, increased um, uh, risk of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. However, they were associated with increased risk of diabetes. So that is important nuance that uh, the DAD uh, study began to show us. There was even another uh, tidbit here is that a, a large decrease in BMI was actually associated with a higher uh, risk of cardiovascular disease in the DAD core. And an advanced study uh, going along with uh, uh, the greater weight gain, treatment emergent metabolic syndrome was also seen more commonly uh, in people on the volutegravir arms than in the swift fibers. Uh, this is what should be. So that's, um, um, uh, here is some contrasting findings about the metabolic outcomes of INST on the one hand and PATH on another hand. Like I said earlier, just because they both lead to weight gain doesn't mean that they arrive at it at the same, by the same mechanism or that they have the same associations. So if you first look from the left, this is the data uh, from the still ongoing retrieve trial where people even with HIV but still with low ACVD risk for uh, randomized receive statin or not, that's on the left. <clears throat> uh, in this cohort, ST users were more likely to develop obesity and uh, they, but they were not more likely uh, to have a higher fasting glucose, a, a, a higher fasting LDL metabolic syndrome or hypertension. But if you look on the right, this is the cohort studies where people are uh, switched to TAF or remain on the uh, baseline regimen. A switching to TAF led to increases in total cholesterol, in HDL, in LDL, and triglyceride after 18 months, uh, even if there was no significant change in uh, total cholesterol to HDL ratio. So we now see that it's not as simple a picture um, as we, we initially thought, and I invite you to continue to compare and contrast the metabolic associations of weight gain with ST on the one hand and TAF on the other. And to finish, we we'll also look at uh, the uh, one final metabolic complication of weight gain uh, after antiviral therapy that we look at is hepatic steatosis, which is very much linked to visceral adiposity. In this study, they measured uh, 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 liver fat by continuous uh, uh, attenuation uh, uh, parameter in the uh, transient elastography in uh, 319 uh, people with HIV on art. And it's a prospective cohort. And among these people, uh, about half of them had no baseline statuses. And among those with no baseline statuses, 69 or 45% developed treatment emergent steatosis. And uh, BMI of uh, more than 23. Uh, uh, in male was significantly associated with development of this de novo steatosis. Uh, TDA was associated with a lower risk of the novo steatosis. So that's what uh, the, the, uh, that shows you. So that's, uh, that's important. Uh, again, we see TDA being pro protective of, of a bona fide metabolic complication that people living with HIV uh, are prone to. And however, here in this analysis, exposure to that and instance were associated with an increased risk of the novo steatosis. Other predictors of the novo steatosis included uh, lower NADCD4 count, uh, BMI, understandably, and higher levels of uh, 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 fibrosis, uh, fibrosis. So uh, here is 
one thing that you will ask me and that unfortunately I will like, I will have to tell you that I don't know or that we don't know yet and we're not sure yet. And which is a, a least different conversation, a difficult conversation with your patients. Can anything be done um, uh, when people gain weight on antiretroviral therapy? And what threshold do you decide that something has to be done? None of these questions are appropriately answered. Now, there are only two possibilities. One is antiretroviral switch. Reversal of weight gain that occurred uh, with uh, either initiation or switch to insulin time. It's not clear that is reversal is certain. It's possible, but it's not clear. And another question that you might ask me, so I will preemptively answer it. It's not clear that removing only insti and leaving TAP or removing only TAP and leaving insti will also uh, 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 lead to a lot of success. Now, we eagerly awaiting uh, data from uh, an ACTG trial, and there are others as well, to give us this. So far, there are small observational studies suggesting reversal of not, not, not just the weight, but the uh, metabolic complication. I prefer not to present them because I think the data is still very fragile. Um, then the second option you may have is lifestyle or modification. We all know how, it is easy, how easy it is to change our lifestyle, right? So that exercise that we reported to work, and so the benefits of this diet and exercise could include uh, prevention, mitigation of other non-age complications that had not to do with uh, And also the DHHS guidelines that count, uh, uh, tell us to counsel patients on lifestyle modification and diet intervention and studying exercise. I would actually tell you that before you initiate antiretroviral therapy, it's a conversation to have. People don't like when physicians uh, tell it, they things that they're not sure of, but it's important to have that candle with your patient that we don't know whether you're gonna gain weight. We're not sophisticated enough to find out here. And we don't know whether that weight gain will be able to be reversed should it yeah, occur. So what do we need to know? We need to better understand the particulars. We know sex, race, ethnicity, but there's still too much variability, even within those predictors. We need to better understand the mechanism. Again, they may not be the same for instance and staff at the time. We need uh, 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 data on uh, better data than what we have now. According to this, I think dysfunction of instance, but that, I don't know yet. Um, insights from PrEP tell us what happens even if you don't have HIV, so that teasing out the effect of antiretrovirus. The original fat disposition, I told you that the weight gain in advance was most cent uh, above, uh, mostly central, but also peripheral. And, and now while they also gain lean mass, they gain mostly fat mass. And what happens um, uh, uh, with appetite and metabolic rates? So maybe when you take these drugs, you start eating more. We haven't even looked at that yet. Uh, and maybe when you take these drugs, you, you absorb more of your food. We, we don't know. So we need to better understand uh, these differences especially we need to understand reversibility and mitigating factors, as well as predictors. I talked to you about adipose kinds, but it's not yet ready for prime time. So let's summarize uh, at the end of the hour. There is accumulating data that ESTs and tap based uh, regimens are associated with uh, greater weight gain than other regimens, um, and also PR to some extent. Uh, increased weight gain are more seen uh, in the newer industry and mostly in blacks and, and Hispanics and mostly in women. Initial data on patterns and uh, mechanisms suggests mostly fat and with histes, and that uh, we need to evaluate that there's an effect on uh, appetite, calorie intake, and energy, energy expenditure. Metabolic complications, we've seen them, um, uh, there are increased lipids with that, but not with histes. There are possible onset of metabolic syndrome, not yet evidence uh, uh, increase in cardiovascular disease. Insulin resistance is there and hepatic cyclosis is there. And so we need to make uh, sure that we're mindful of this. And uh, uh, patient with significant weight, uh, we need to know what we should do. And, uh, I think intuitively, um, if people with massive weight gain should switch, but we don't have the parameters to determine how much uh, health that that will uh, uh, give them. So uh, thank you. I think uh, we can, um, um, uh, Jose, I believe we can go back to this uh, post test question. OK. So now we have a um, uh, MJ, a 30-year-old Hispanic woman, who was diagnosed with HIV in 2017 or with teen screening, uh, had no uh, history of post infection, based on CTF-159, uh, viral load 57,000. <coughs> 
she initiated antiviral therapy with the chemical antipsychotic for number two years. She gained um, a lot of weight. Uh, she did not see any change in diet exercise. So, which one is the correct um, uh, answer regarding uh, weight gain in this person? Weight gain uh, most likely to, would have been most likely to occur was she a man um, than a woman. Um, weight gain more likely to occur with an MRTS. Weight gain more likely to occur with calf, or if this person was not uh, receiving antiviral therapy for HIV, but was receiving it for PrEP, she would not have had weight uh, increase, or all of the above. Please vote. And please vote right. All right, fantastic, thank you. So now we see that after looking at the data that we presented, 91% of you correctly show that the weight gain is mostly with calf. Now it's mostly with women, not with men, and it's mostly with instees, not NNRTI. And even with exposure to Atatrawa in the uh, uh, people without HIV like in PEP, there is weight gain. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, so four is not correct. Neither is five, by definition. So finally, post-test question two, A, B, 32-year-old black woman has uh, been virologically suppressed on a five-year-old uh, TDFFTC since 2012, developed complications of it, and then uh, switched to the Litegravia back of it three years ago and gained 25 pounds. Uh, some people are not unhappy with gaining weight. Uh, so let's not um, um, uh, look at body shaming or anything. So they gain weight, they're okay with it, but you wanna make sure as the provider that they don't have uh, metabolic complications. So what do you tell them? Number one, that dolitegravir is associated with a significant worsening of the lipid profile, which correlates with the weight gain. Number two, that there is no risk of metabolic complications because most of the weight gain is lean, not fat. Number three, weight gain on other therapies associated with uh, increased risk of cardiovascular diseases in the studies that we have looked at. And number four, that weight gain on other therapies associated with an increase of metabolic syndrome. Please vote. All right. Can I see the answers? Fantastic. So not quite 90%, but 87% got it right. And um, uh, the litigravir, unlike TAP, is not as we increase the lipids. Uh, that's also uh, one is uh, incorrect. Uh, so two, there is a risk of metabolic complication. Uh, again, the weight gain on the litigravir is both uh, fat and lean mass, probably more than former. So answer two is incorrect. Three, uh, working on natural acquired therapy has not yet been shown to be associated with increased cardiovascular disease. At least we show the DAD cohort. Again, uh, uh, maybe tomorrow there will be newer data that will show that to be the case. I won't uh, discount that. So um, that's a possibility for now. Uh, so, but metabolic syndrome, both in the DAD and in uh, uh, advanced cohort, we have already seen significant increase in metabolic syndrome. Another thing that we see is uh, increased risk of uh, NAFLD, which is again uh, uh, a concerning trend in, in people with HIV. So, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'll be happy to entertain more questions. Back to you, Jose. Thank you, Dr. Bedimo. So to review the questions, you may click on the Q&A button and all questions from attendees will be visible through there. Oh, okay, hold on, let's go to the Q&A. I guess I did not do my homework, Jose, sorry. Okay, is, um, is it possible that differential weight gain by drug class and within ISTIS is confounded by differential accompaniment of TDA? Excellent question. Uh, um, uh, that's one that actually um, 
planning to delve in uh, because you have seen um, all these analyses. We never, we haven't seen enough of them looking at the the, the NRTI back home. So in our analysis here at uh, uh, in Dallas, we are beginning to tease out uh, carefully the exposure uh, of uh, instis versus PS versus NRTI with exposures of uh, Pika versus CDS versus Abaka, at least those three, as it's very well possible, uh, except that I do not um, um, have uh, evidence of that. Okay, that's good. So why is your presented claiming obesity is a disease when it's not diagnosed with mental illness? Okay, so I would uh, take, um, um, uh, uh, I would apologize for this. Again, I told you that, you know, that just because somebody has a, a better weight doesn't mean that this anything necessarily wrong with them and it's not a disease. Um, um, however, we have something that has been termed uh, obesogenic uh, epidemic. Now, I think that maybe we should remove the term uh, because of not as a disease. Uh, point well taken. Uh, so any thoughts or studies using GLP-1s uh, to diminish uh, weight again uh, or SNG2? Okay, I'm having trouble turning off the sand anonymously. Okay, uh, and you just enter my name. So no, no worries, I will not. Uh, um, um, uh, <clears throat> so it's important. This is uh, something that actually what I want to do is to see if uh, we can inform ourselves more with the data that the FDA uses to, to assess a lot of the, uh, the drug for weight loss. In that, look at the percentage of people who gain a certain amount of weight on them. I think that those, um, uh, we have uh, have some initial data with uh, metformin, um, uh, but not the newer classes uh, of antidiabetics in terms of uh, weight. Uh, decrease. And again, I don't know that this will be indicated in people who do not have uh, diabetes. So uh, likely a lot more data to come. So uh, next question, are folks on tap for PrEP experience with them? Yes. So the Discover study, again, there was a lot of data that's been presented everything. Now we're comparing TAF FTC to TDF FTC. There was greater weight uh, uh, gain with the TAF FTC. Thank you. So is there data comparing uh, different types of ART compared to an HIV negative po population with regard to weight gain? So in other words, do we know uh, that the weight gain is because of ART and not because of the person would have gained weight anyway with age? Well, thank you so much. This is uh, actually one of the reasons I started this presentation by putting this conceptual framework that is the patient there is the disease and there is the drug. You cannot look at either in isolation. And taking HIV out of the equation was looking at effect of antiviral therapy on weight in people on PrEP. And, um, and that is uh, 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 what we have seen, uh, some weight gain uh, with TAF uh, FTC, but probably weight loss with uh, TDF, which is uh, the IPREX data. So, Important. So, how does the advanced analysis of weight gain by CIP 2B6 genotype impact your understanding of weight gain? Specifically, in the analysis, they found no difference in weight change between the retrograde here and CIP 2B6 past metabolizers of the prevalence. And based on these findings, uh, as author stated, weight gain uh, from the new ART is a return to health and an off-target effect. Do you agree? Okay. Let's go fantastic. Again, you know, we have to be selective in what we put there. This analysis of the dance was very interesting. What they had are three categories of uh, people on the effervescence arms. The fast metabolizer, the intermediate, and the slow metabolizer. What it did show here, <clears throat> uh, like you uh, stated, <clears throat> um, um, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, interestingly, in that those who uh, uh, were fast metabolizers in the effervescence group had as much gain as the retrograde. So basically, it's the exposure 
uh, to uh, Pythagoras, the levels of Pythagoras, um, uh, um, to dictate uh, a weight gain. And so that is important to, to take into consideration that it's possible, again, that will lead you to potential mechanisms that we don't know yet because nobody has done the study to my knowledge that go with an LD with uh, adiposite stem cells as well as uh, SIV monkeys to see if a fibrinase would be associated with adiposite toxicity. All the studies that I did not present to you have actually shown that unlike NRTI, and I don't believe they did have um, an NRTI in that study, the literature here concentrated on um, uh, instis concentrated more in the adipose tissue than the other classes of drugs. So suggesting that they not only get them more, but they, then they're more likely to impart this adipose dysfunction. We do not know that. And I'm not sure that I will go so far as to say that this is, this is proof that uh, this is just return to health because it's uh, uh, contradicted by the evidence of people already virologically suppressed on ART. So, what if client is already on TAF when switched to ISTIS? Uh, is weight gain as significant? Yeah, a, a, interesting question. Of course, uh, uh, we do have um, uh, some people who only switch at the top. Of course, it, it, these are in clinical observations like uh, another uh, 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 person had asked earlier, difficult to tease that out because uh, uh, we, we don't have um, in many studies, um, the um, um, uh, that that's control, but the opera cohort uh, can get a little bit to that because now you look at uh, people, regardless of the NRTI switch to instis, who are associated with the increased weight. So that's the data from the opera cohort that you can uh, uh, go and look at. So that the answer to that is yes. So um, uh, thank you for the review. Thank you, I appreciate that. As a pediatrician, I'm especially concerned about weight gain in adolescents. As uh, Dolitegra here now is first line. Do you <laughs> comment on last data in the adolescent population? Oh, this is actually uh, tomorrow. I'm talking to someone who is doing a fantastic work on this uh, patient population, not just adolescent, but what he's looking at the people who are very who, who perinatally acquired HIV and was followed for many years to adolescents. Uh, compared to those who were exposed to HIV, which is not acquired in most adolescents, and beginning to tease out the differences uh, in weight change. So uh, we know still have found that uh, this data is likely to come out really soon, and you will get uh, uh, an answer. So, um, so you would or would not change patient with severe hepatic steatosis <laughs> on this regimen. Yeah, so let me preface my response by saying that I am not putting guidelines um, beginning to react to emerging data, some of which is concerning. The last data that I presented on NAFLD suggests that we probably should. And, and I cannot wait until we get a lot of data to uh, confirm that we definitely should. So are there data on weight gain in persons using TAFET to see for PrEP? Uh, yes, and uh, this is a disclosure study uh, comparing um, uh, TAF FTC to uh, uh, TDF FTC, and, and, and there is uh, a greater weight gain in the uh, former. So, um, so you would or would not change patient severe, oh, sorry, is that the same question? Uh, severe patient severity. I would change. Um, again, um, and this is my own, um, uh, uh, he said, because I know what complication of is, you know, we we really making significant strides in in, in treating HCV in our people. What is causing a lot of uh, people's uh, concerns when it comes to the liver now is NAFLD that progresses to NASH and and um, and cirrhosis. So yes, I think it's reasonable to change. Um, so any genetic explanation of weight gain? Well, I must say it is assumed. Um, you have in the U.S. data people with uh, 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 Blacks and, and, um, and, and uh, Latinx are more likely to gain weight. In advanced data South Africa, where it's all Blacks, the magnitude weight gain was even greater than was in the US. So you have to assume genetic, but environmental factors, maybe. But the other thing that is important here in, in, on the genetic side is that 
even in the population of Sierra Mola to begin with, i.e. women or uh, and Black Hispanic, there's a great variability. You probably have observed in your clinic that the majority of people you put them on these drugs, uh, they're not gaining weight at all. But then there's a small minority, they gain an amazing amount of weight. So that huge variability is, is a complicating factor clinically. Um, so the averages that you see in studies are just that average. They're not helpful to the patient in front of you. You need to be able to uh, uh, analyze that particular patient and individualize their care. So have you, uh, how do you see the weight loss effect of uh, an epi-suppressing effect on TDA? I am incredibly interested in that uh, uh, issue. So we, we do, I mean, I mean, that led me to some editorializing uh, lipids. We, the, the pathogens um, uh, um, have a way of hijacking uh, the lipid metabolism for their own use because they need it. Uh, on the other hand, we, um, uh, lipids may be doing a little more than just, um, um, uh, you know, energy storage. So I will take you to the, the data on, on statins, for instance. So we've been looking at statins, and of course, what they do for a living is, is decreasing your lipids. And then we've been seeing incredible other health benefits, decreasing the risk of cancers and other things. Like that. So we, 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 we think that there could be an association between inflammatory immunomodulatory effects and that may be something that, again, pure speculation on my part, no data to stand on, is that TDF may be doing something similar, but um, that will tell. I think uh, people will soon probably do uh, studies on that uh, uh, in vitro and in vivo to, to, to go for. So if a certain patient does gain a significant amount of weight when changing, Anesty, what type of regimen would you change to if indeed it's that change? Okay, so what is um, um, uh, ACTG 53 and one study doing? They're switching them from an institute to a non new one of the newest non new uh, which is uh, uh, Doratory. They're switching them from TAF to TDF. So that's, uh, that's a change that people are making, of course. You have some degree of trepidation out there. People are saying, well, it wouldn't that be a bad thing to do to switch someone from TAF to TDF? Are we moving backwards? Well, probably not. Um, and uh, yeah, look at the, 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 what are the potential consequences? We have the kidneys and the bones. Are they likely to occur in the conjunction with non nukes as they, they, they are if, if you were to put them on TIA? So probably not. So, so that's something that people do. And I am, um, of course, not at, um, um, probably will be some issues with putting someone in the older and in the like if I've with these attendant uh, uh, issues. And so, however, a newer uh, NNRTIs are things we should be considering. And we shouldn't really shy away from uh, switching back to the if you think that that has been seen with uh, very wicked. Again, uh, on, uh, um, I want to, uh, preempt the arrows that might come my way. I don't have the studies to back that. I just think that as clinicians, we're not faced with a problem that we may need to respond to before we get a lot of data. So uh, how to tackle the weight gain as if uh, art in prison be okay. So that's sort of the same thing. I, I, I must apologize that <laughs> The biggest question most of you came with, <laughs> I don't have answers to. <laughs> what can be done? We, we don't want to point to a problem and tell you, oh, we don't know what to do with that problem. And, and but we, we, we try. So when a patient asks you, uh, I want to change my ERT because of my weight gain, uh, what is your response? Well, um, I will hope that before we get there, I have told the patient when I was initiating another therapy that there is a potential. Because I don't want to lose someone's confidence. And I think we are in danger of losing a person's confidence when we don't tell them that there's something, something might happen. And it does happen. We say, yeah, yeah, we knew you could gain weight, but you didn't tell me. <laughs> and so, so that's uh, important. Then, then, then that occurs. Now we tell them that, okay, now we, 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 we don't know that for a fact, but you might lose some all this weight if we were to switch you, well, here are the options. And, and, and admitting candle and pro proposing the options, letting the patient be 
the person making their own decision is, I think, is an important um, uh, 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 stance. So, okay, is there similar weighting in pediatrics? Uh, yes, I think uh, it's been seen in Africa, and, and, and I ask that to, to someone else that uh, I know people for a fact who are looking at this and who are generating fantastic data, and, and I think you will see that out there. So, thank you for education. I really appreciate it. Um, um, uh, Jose, I can go as long as you let me go. And uh, when you want me to stop, just cut me off. Yeah. So Dr. Bedimo, um, if you have the time available, you can go through the questions. Um, but if you don't, we could close out the webinar. Okay. It's all right. So let me look at the next uh, questions. Dr. Wanda Fiora and practice. Have you switched ART in patients uh, who have gained with PTB cardiac? Yeah. So, so again, I, I really do apologize, Dr. Fiora. I mean, this is a question that I've received a lot. I hate to um, tell you things that are not yet solid, that don't yet have solid evidence behind it, but a switch makes sense. Um, minimal weight gain, okay, rather, is there any data that demonstrated minimal weight gain, rather more weight loss in uh, patients with HIV and treatment above patient uh, 65? There was some study that came out. Yes, yeah, so so that's a that, that, that's a important point. So let's go back to um, all the studies with uh, um, all the NRTIs, AGT, for instance, uh, with uh, Lapuato, we all kind of uh, I mean, uh, uh, familiar with those. And then let's look at the sacs al analysis of all these Gilead studies by 8,000 patients. And look at the trajectory of people on TDF in that, in, in, in that pool analysis. It's actually going downwards. And, and then look at the IPREX, looking at uh, uh, comparing TDF versus to placebo, there's a, a, a delay in the weight gain. So there's, there has to be something to this, and that probably more likely to occur in these people in the older age. That is fragile, I don't know yet, but important. So some may actually have lower levels of uh, how does lower or that influence with gain from oh, Well, okay, so I imagine the questioner is getting to the point of uh, the difference in the pharmacokinetics of uh, TDF and TAF. Okay, so not for here is the same active moiety. With uh, TDF, you have um, a lot more of it staying in um, uh, uh, <clears throat> extracellularly and a lot less of it getting intracellular. So that's why in TAPS, it's most of the uh, intercellular pressure is greater and fewer and, and lower extracellular uh, 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 level of uh, TFD. It's thought that this is what leads to fewer off target effects, i.e., bone and kidney. Now, is it by corollary what leads to greater weight gain? In that we start getting yeah, more in the adipose tissue. I would be lying if I told you I knew that. That's a possibility. Uh, I don't. So, do you personally discuss risk uh, of weight gain metabolic syndrome on patients starting cases? Yes, I do. Uh, potentially choosing regimen uh, on uh, based on presenting risk factor. Uh, yes, I do. And again, uh, we not are not. However, I'm not avoiding cases in this case. Again, I, I I I think I tried to preempt this question earlier by saying that. Uh, let's not, uh, again, this is not a PC thing to say, but let's not throw the baby out of the bathwater. The, the ideas are incredibly uh, 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 important uh, and safe uh, drugs, and the DHHS and the IAS USA guidelines, they're the preferred regimen uh, for most people. So you, you cannot say that we, we want to really nearly depart from this. However, if I had a person of African descent, a woman, a BMI of 35, and I would tell them that I, I really think that you are at the higher risk of weight gain on ST than most. Um, and and uh, let's, you know, uh, I'm willing to share the information with you and you, you tell me if you think you want to go with it. So, so good idea to save a TDF uh, as a lot of regimen using a back of your head. Possible to the uh, to drug therapy in younger patients. Ah, it's an opinion. I imagine I I, I will not comment. 
So thank you, I appreciate it. And uh, so uh, Jose, I think that, um, the, let's see, we can try this again. Uh, yeah, so uh, how do we differentiate with gain in children to charity and on due to growth? Yeah, well, incredibly important question. Again, the pediatric data is, uh, is emerging and you will see. So, um, and I really thank you all. Um, uh, so the last question in Germany, the change therapy is often, but the gain increase, I said. So maybe it is, so yeah, it, 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 that's the problem. Now, I, I don't want to tell someone, I'm gonna change your weight, you're gonna gain all this weight you lost. And if it doesn't happen, then what am I gonna tell them? It, it's really a, a conundrum. So I really thank you all very much. Um, uh, I appreciate your uh, listening and I appreciate your feedback. And uh, Jose, feel free to share my contact information. I'll be happy to entertain any additional comments, questions about this issue. Data is still emerging. I, I had hoped that we will be farther along than we are now in understanding, but uh, I think there are strides. So thank you very much and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Bedimo. As a reminder to our audience, evaluation and how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. tomorrow, and this will enable us to review all of those that have to attended today's live program. Here are a list of our upcoming webinars, and we have a special two-part series regarding the CROI 2022 update. For more information, please visit the IAS USA website. Here are our upcoming courses for April and June. The first one will be from Atlanta, Georgia, and the second one will be in New York. And lastly, um, here is our upcoming dialogue scheduled for April 1st. For more information, visit the IAS USA website. Lastly, we'd like to thank Dr. Bedimo and to the audience for your participation. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jose. Wonderful.